Okay, good evening and welcome to tonight's FA Coach Development webinar, which is entitled A Female Coaching in the Male Game, Experience, Challenges and Opportunities. Uh, my name's Matt Jones and I'm one of the newly appointed Regional Coach Development Officers operating in the DNI space across the West Midlands. I'm joined tonight by my colleague Sarah, who will just briefly introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Loudon. Um, like Matt, I'm a newly appointed appointed coach development officer working in diversity and inclusion in the northwest region we're both coach coach educators so not presenters although we aspire to be like uh, phil and holly from this morning but you'll be able to tell us with the feedback at the end whether or not we've achieved that so the way it'll work tonight if it allows us that is uh, we have about an hour give or take it will be a game of two halves with a slightly longer half with added time uh, to the second half uh, but without the half-time oranges, because we'll aim to power through to make best use of everyone's time. The first half will be Sarah and myself grilling the panel. And I'm emphasising the word grilling just to see if I get a reaction out of our three panellist guests. Not one of them flinched. That's why they've got the job. They've remained in cool, calm and collected under pressure. Uh, but now, all jokes aside, we're going to feed in some questions under the umbrella topic of a female coaching in the male game. And the second half will open up to Q&A, so feel free to start populating the chat box with any questions that you would like to ask. So introducing our guest panel, it's important to say all three are very experienced, knowledgeable and competent coaches, period. Uh, to introduce them individually, Georgie Van Dyke is a UEFA B qualified coach, uh, currently working with Birmingham City Boys Academy under 10s. Kidderminster Harriers Youth Academy under 21s and the University of De Montford Men's Football Club. So she's a very busy, active coach. Georgie is also an FA Club Placement Programme graduate. So welcome, Georgie. Thank you. Uh, our second coach this evening is uh, a fabulous young coach working in the south of England. She's gained experience with Arsenal Girls and currently coaching with Arsenal Boys Academy. Um, and also is working with us at the FA with the women's under-16 England squad. So please welcome uh, Corrine, Corrine Brown. Thanks, Sarah, and hi all. And last but by certainly no means least is Hannah Dingley. She's a UEFA Pro Licence holder, who is the current head of academy at League Two side Forest Green Rovers, having formerly been the head of coaching at Burton Albion. Good evening, Hannah. Good evening, everyone. So thank you to all three of you for joining us tonight and for giving us your valuable time and insight. I'm intentionally now going to take the slides down. Because what we want tonight to be is forward facing conversation around coaching football under that heading of females coaching in the male game. So a quick question to all three of you just to get warmed up in true football fashion. Quite simply, why do you coach? And that one's aimed at Georgie. Big question to start with, I like it. Um, I'd say, well, to be honest, when I first started coaching, it was just something because I liked doing it. I was sort of there in the moment. I just started helping out. Um, but then it soon grew and I started to develop and I started to develop players. And then I realised that it was something that I enjoyed because I got to impact other people's journey within the game. I think that's still the main reason why I coach is because I get to impact other people positively but also I get to learn myself and also develop myself and one day I'll get to where I want to get to and that's just from putting in the effort and long hours over the many many years. As your introduction suggests you're busy for all the right reasons. Absolutely. Corrine why do you coach? In general I, I really love helping people and also I'm a big fan of football in itself so uh, marrying up, uh, uh, being a fan of football um, and enjoying playing through to becoming an adult and then actually I enjoy having people. Coaching was a great opportunity to directly impact on working with people. So I really enjoy supporting youth and their development, their life skills, but then also their opportunities to develop as players on the pitch. And then also opportunities to even support coaches as well and, and help coaches develop within their pathway and their aspirations as well. So in general, it's a, it's a great passion just to see how your involvement and your experience and your gift 
can help another human being just thrive in terms of whatever it is that they're trying to achieve in life. And I can sense the passion in that answer there. So Hannah, passion, clearly something that you share. Player development's a common theme. Does that transcend up to the level that you're coaching at as a reason for doing what you do? Yeah, and I think um, certainly when I was growing up, you know, I might be a bit older than some, um, the pathway wasn't always there for playing. And it, for me, it was a way of getting into the game that I loved um, and inspiring others. Um, and obviously, player development is a massive part of my role now. And I'm really lucky to be able to do it from a more of a strategic level now. So it's less on the pitch stuff, more like what do we want to achieve as an organisation and how can we work together to, to develop the players and to hopefully get into our first team and beyond. OK, that, that's great. That's, that's, you know, for us, just to understand actually, you know, what is coaching to you guys and why, why is it so important? I guess the, the obvious question for me that, that I'd love to know is what was your first introduction to coaching? So where did you start? And did that drive you into the male game in particular? So where did you start? And then how did you actually get into coaching in the male game? So I'm going to direct that to Kareem first. I think my first introduction to coaching was probably an introduction without me knowing it. I remember being at college and it was a, a college where I sort of stay as a, a residential, so sort of like a football college, if you like, and as part of the course, um, they introduced us to the level one. I don't even actually think I knew I was on the level one at that point in time, to be honest. Um, it, I was just sort of doing a course as part of a, a wider course. Um, and then later on, just sort of being a part of my local community, um, a, a, a letter came through the door just trying to engage residents into coaching and it came from QPR in the community and I was like oh like, I'm interested in this why not let me give them a call like, at that point in time never had much experience um by then I probably knew I had a level one I probably figured that out by then but I thought yeah as I said that something came from my door I feel like I've got something to give I've got knowledge of the game I'm playing at that point in time so why not and and that was my very very first introduction in terms of coaching, so keeping on the community in, in schools and in local estates in London. Okay. Uh, Hannah, what, what about yourself then? What was the first introduction to actually coaching? Where did you start? Again, I keep harping on about my age, but <laughs> when I you know, started coaching, there, there wasn't that opportunity for girls to play as much. Um, and coaching was my opportunity to get into the game. Um, and I started long time ago, coaching my local village team, my local mm. men's village team. There wasn't a women's team. There was no choice. You coach men or you didn't coach at all. Um, and then when I went to university, um, I, I, I tried to play. I kept, kept trying to keep playing. So obviously with the women's game being played on a Sunday, Saturday afternoons were an opportunity to go out and coach and to coach the game. Um, so throughout my time at university, I was coaching non-league men's football. And then I got a bit of a buzz for it. You know, you get a buzz for the crowds, you know, for people watching and, you know, the game. Um, and from then on, it was, I suppose, the start of my journey. So your actual first experience was was coaching a men's team then? Yeah. Yeah, throughout the pathway, I coached men's teams. Um, I suppose it, we just fell into it. Um, it was where I started. Um, and as I said, on the coach education pathway at the time, you had to do it to pass. Um, mm. So your only experience is wherever coaching men. So to pass your level two, your B licence, we, we never had the opportunity to coach female players. It was always male candidates, therefore you're working with male players. Um, so part of being able to progress through the pathway was being able to coach in that environment. Um, so I tried to get as much experience of doing it as I could. OK, that, that's really interesting. Georgie, what about yourself then? How, how did you first get introduced to coach and where did you start? Well, mine's quite a bit different to the traditional way of getting into coaching. Normally you're playing and then you coach, then you just fall into coaching. But I actually started coaching when I was 13 and I started coaching a boys team when I was 13 and they were probably about five six years old and it was my brother's team and I just started getting involved and then it just sort of took off from there and then I was yeah 13 years old just working my way up and I was just dying to do my level one I was like, I want to do my level one, but obviously I had to be 16 so I waited a few couple of years and then I did my level one and it just sort of took off from there and I started coaching in different different areas so within the community and then it got to academy placements internships um but it yeah just really sort of took off from just doing sunday league to then coaching so many different environments and i remember when i was driving to coach my dad was driving me to my session i was about 14 15 still with the same team 
and he just randomly said that imagine if you were the first female in like coaching or managing in the prep and I was like yeah okay yeah I'll do that then and that was literally from that point I was like I knew what I wanted to do and there was sort of no stopping me from getting to where I wanted to get to and obviously it's changed slightly since then like it's for me it's not so much about being the first I don't want to be the best I'll be honest mm. the best coach there is in the level that I want to coach at so yeah it was just sort of like a hobby and now I'm getting paid to do that hobby which baffles me I don't know how I've managed that but I'm getting paid to do something that literally started out as like a little hobby when I was 13 and now I'm getting paid and I coach seven days a week six seven days a week and it's just I'm not really sure how I've managed that but somehow somehow I've managed that but yeah that's sort of how it all started to, to sort of where I am now well they say don't they if you get a job that's your hobby you never have to work a day in your absolutely. life absolutely that for me is a very dangerous quote because just listening to you all speak again so passionately I know that you will work hard and that quote suggests that when you get that job which you've had to work hard for in the first place when you arrive there you still have to work hard to keep it because there's other people chasing you wanting to fill that space I mean Hannah I just want to quickly replace the word age with experience and that's designed to make you feel a little bit better but what those answers suggest to me is that there's different inroads to coaching Hannah it was interesting that you felt you had to coach men because there were no other alternative. So it wasn't even an intention, it was a, an either or. You either do it or you, or you don't. Um, whereas propelled to the other end, Georgie, you've come at it from a different angle and Karina, you're almost somewhere in between. So it just shows that there's, there's inroads and there's possibilities. Um, what I would really like to know is, and this is open, open to, to any one of you, is how did you feel going to coach in the male game initially? Were you apprehensive? When you got there, were those apprehensions confirmed? Or was it not what you thought? Was it the complete opposite? Hannah, I can see you bursting. Yeah, I can tell you some stories. Because what I thought coaching was, particularly in the male game, was shouting a lot, quite often swearing a lot, <laughs> kicking things, and generally trying to be that sort of, a, probably quite aggressive person that you see on the touchline. Because that's what I thought football coaching, football management was, because that's what you maybe see on the TV, and that's what I'd been around in the non league game. Um, and it's interesting as you gain more experience and find your own path that you know you find your own way. But at the time, I was ultra, I had to, you know, if you don't swear every other word, you're not coaching properly. You know, I, I am working with men here, not children, by the way. Um, you know, they were adults. But that was sort of the perception of what I felt I had to do to gain respect was to be a really shouty, sweary person. Um, and then obviously, as you sort of mature into it, that you realise actually that's got really not a lot to do with it at all. You know, it's about what you know and how you pass that information on and the respect you gain through your abilities, not through that, that way that you present yourself. But initially, that was what I was uh, sort of thought the expectation was of me. Cool. So what I want you to explore some of those feelings. And just to add to the question then, Karee, do you feel there is any difference coaching in the male game by comparison to coaching in the female game? And if there are any differences, what would be your advice to any coaches that want to step into coaching in the male game? Any female aspirational young coaches out there? Yeah, so there are, there are going to be differences, but I think every environment is different in itself. Uh, and what I mean by that is, like, similar to others, um, following me doing QPR on the community, I, I went on to do sort of grassroots boys teams um, with my local community and so to an extent sort of coordinated a set up at, at a grassroots club um, from like the under 10s to under 16s. And um, that, that environment in itself, because it was local to me, I was very, very comfortable. And um, these, these young 15 year olds and the coaches around me um, highly respected me. Um, because I sort of was sure of myself, I believed in myself, I had the confidence to go and deliver um, based on that. But then also I was able to, to build a rapport with the, the various different people around me, whether it be the young people I'm coaching or the coaches that are around me, I think, which I think is very important. So understanding the environment, understand the people you're working with. Uh, and then with that then being said, it allows for that dynamic to be built and, and driven, but then also for you to add value as well and be respected with that value that you're adding. Uh, so in, in relation to now being a, in a more elite environment, so moving from sort of grassroots environment to elite environment, um, there, again, it always going to be differences, but again, it's, it's that environment of 
in actual fact, well, what, what value can I bring as an individual and using my own skills, my personal and professional skills to add value to that particular environment. Now, what, the, the, game, the game looks different. I think most of us know that. Um, the, the male game and the female game look different. We're really talking about professional level, we're talking about youth level, it looks different. So as a coach, you should have different tools in your basket or you should aim to have different tools in your basket because you're going to be faced with different challenges, uh, whether you're working with female players, whether you're working with male players, but then also amongst male players, there's differences as well. So having different tools in your basket to be able to work with different male players, it's the same in the female game, having different tools in your basket to work with different female players. But I think the most important thing is, is understanding your value as a coach and being confident to bring that forward to no matter what environment you're working in would be what I would suggest. So coaching's a toolbox. Good coach picks the right tool at the right time. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, Georgie, just touching on the fact that you said you didn't come through the traditional route of having played. So add that to the equation of differences in maybe coaching in the male environment and the fact that you didn't have playing or a whole heap of playing experience behind you. What were your feelings like turning up to those first few sessions? Um, I mean, I was playing slightly, when I was 13, I was still playing and I still played for a couple of years, but then when coaching sort of kicked off more and my boys were always playing, so I was like, I want to coach them. So I couldn't play. So I would say I was very confident going into the environment because it was a new environment and I was, I've always been quite a confident person, but I think the attention I got was strange because I wasn't used to getting that sort of attention and I really stood out because I was like the first and only girl not even like girl, young girl coaching at the club so that was quite a new thing and I sort of was known as oh yeah the girl that coaches the boys that was sort of like my title like that was sort of what I did for that many years and I was there from their under fives and I went through to them being under 17 so I was there for a long time so I really saw their development which I guess gave me more confidence in I've got them to this point I do know stuff and I know the game well. I might not have played to a really high level, but I played to a certain level and the hours and time I've spent coaching really sort of each time I've coached really helped me. Like, well, I've done that. Like, I've done that. I got over that hurdle. Let's let's go again. So I wouldn't even say it was that daunting coming into it, but that's the sort of person I am. I'm sort of I like challenges. So it wasn't a big problem, but obviously it could have been because it's going into a club when there's all these teams, all these players and you're a 13 year old girl. It could be seen as quite a lot to take, but I, f I feel like I love that sort of environment anyway. So I really sort of thrived in it and did what I needed to do. So you strike me as a very positive person. Do you have that positivity coming at you from people around you at the club, around the, the players and their parents? Yeah, I do. Um, I also try to bring it because I feel like it helps other people when you come in smiling. It helps everyone else. <laughs> Even when things are stressful, I feel like you've got to bring that because football can be very stressful. And like over the past couple of years, I've realised how stressful it can be with injuries, with loads of different things. And now I've got the added pressure of people getting the amount of minutes they're getting and challenging me on that or injuries again or going out on loan or whatever it might be. So new challenges, you still need the positivity there because it can be very stressful especially working in like the elite game. Um, so and I think it's preparing me well for the future. I'm hoping anyway. Hannah, just before Sarah comes in with another question, have you got any tips for Georgie around managing game time? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a contentious discussion on courses. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I can only really speak about our programme and what we do, you know. It, getting slightly biased to what we obviously trying to put in place at Forest Green um, around group sizes anyway. Um, you know, having smaller group sizes to allow for more game time. Because um, obviously with an elite environment where there's a sort of selection, deselection process, um, you know, one of our sort of thought processes is trying to focus on small groups to individualise everything we do. A lot of the stuff that Corinne talks about, I think it's brilliant, you know, because all the players are individual, male, female, makes they're all individuals so if we can have more time to spend on the individuals in coach in uh, training in games um, in s and c work in psychology work in any aspect of the game if we have more attention to the individual i think we'll help develop better players 
And I just wanted to come in with a question here because you you know you talk about you get noticed more, you might get that attention. Uh, working in that elite environment, so it's possibly quite you know that extra challenge if you like. Um, how would you say that your experience of working in the male game has shaped you as an individual and as a coach? Kareen, what's your, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I've, I've definitely grown from a personal point of view. My, my skin is definitely thicker um, mm. because sometimes, you know, there's, there's banter, we'll call it banter, that you, you need to be aware of, which might be a little bit different in a male dominant environment that is, that is in a, a female dominant environment. Um, but then with that being said, I am the only person in my, in my environment that, that looks like me. And with, with that being said, there's challenges that come with that because there's different experiences I bring. Um, there's a different culture I bring to the table. But ultimately, I need to sort of back myself in order to sort of stand stronger and, and push forward, push ahead with any of them challenges that I might face based on, um, you know, being, you know, the only female in that particular environment. And, and some of the cultural challenges that might come with that. So, yeah, ultimately, um, it's been a great experience. Um, I, you know, I've grown that real thick skin from it, but also I've learned so much on the pitch as well. Like, I can't take away from the fact that my professional development has been absolutely great, and I've worked with a great bunch of people who, you know, really know the game. So I've learned both on a, a personal level, but a professional level as well. And, and ultimately, I, I want to aim to inspire others. Um, I want others to be able to look up at me, whether that be a, a player or a coach, whether that be male or female, um, and in, inspired to be the best that they can be in whatever environment they're in as well. Yeah, certainly. And, and I know for sure that you're doing that in terms of inspiring men and women to do what you're doing. So, um, yeah, it's great to hear that. I mean. Georgie, what would your experience be around that? You know, how's that shaped you being in that environment? And, and are you the only female uh, coach where you um, are? I am. There's at Kinnaminster, there's no female coach within the male, uh, female program. But yeah, I'm the only female at Kidderminster with the men's under 21s at De Montfort Uni and uh, Birmingham. So again, because I'm so used to being in those environments and being sort of the only one, it's obviously at the start it was I really it really did challenge me test me but I felt because I had that early experience within working with men 40 year old men and I was like this little 13 14 year old coach like it really shaped me and helped me but I think for me my confidence from that point although I have always been confident that's just gone to a whole different level and I think that's really important especially for people that are listening that Confidence is one of the big, biggest things you've got to have in coaching in general. But I think especially in the male game, coming in, having that confidence gives you a different level of um, sort of, I wouldn't say power, but sort of edge, I'd say. It gives you a different edge when you come in with that confidence. So obviously you have to be careful with it because you don't want to have too much, but you do have to manage that. But I think confidence is the biggest thing for me that has really pushed me and helped me get to where I'm at right now. What would be your top tip to whether it's a, a young coach, an older coach, a female coach, to build that confidence? Um, I'd say always challenge yourself um, to get better, um, to understand the game more, to understand the players more. Um, and again, being confident, you need to be positive as well with it because there obviously there are days where you might not feel as confident, but you've got to go in with that same energy. Um, that, bat, that other people can bounce off, your players can bounce off. And I do think that helps me a lot. My players clearly like the fact that I'm confident and they can sort of bounce off that and I can help them. They can help me. Um, so, yeah, I'd say to build it up, just you've got to go for it. So each opportunity you've got to go for, challenge yourself. If you get given an opportunity to go out on the grass and coach, go and do it. That's one of the biggest things for me is just go and do it. Even if you're nervous, you've, you've just got to put yourself out there if you really want to test yourself and get to the next level. Good advice. Uh, Hannah, what's success? And, and in order to answer the question, you're probably going to need to define what success means to you. But what success have you experienced or positive experiences have you had coaching in the male game? What jumps out to you? 
Um, I suppose it's just the progression. Um, so again, I, like these guys had a, a wealth of experience having to do different jobs and different, you know, so I coached in the WSL, I coached women's premier sides, but I also coached non-league men's sides. I coached um, academy sides, under nines, under tens. Um, you know, I did all that stuff to get an opportunity. And, I, you know, I was lucky to be at a club you know, to get that opportunity to come ahead of coaching at Burton. Um, and obviously then from then, um, obviously make it a step up to academy manager. Um, but it does take a hell of a lot of work. And, you know, that's not just for females in the game. That's for anybody in the game. You know, these jobs are, you know, highly sought, very difficult to get. Um, you know, and it is about putting yourself out there and getting that experience um, under your belt because it all adds to, you know, that toolbox ultimately because it's all different experiences. Um, you're working with different types of players, different contexts, different challenges, um, and it all helps you develop your confidence, develop your knowledge. Um, and I think the other thing I would point out is just to get the support, because I'm listening to some of these conversations, and I remember distinctly trying to do an A license assessment, and the coach educator just saying, y y "Go and act. You know, you got to go and put, put a performance on." You've almost got, you've got to put your shoulders back, put your head up, go out and perform in front of wherever it was to try and pass this assessment. And I remember it really sort of sticking in, in my head around, you know, sometimes having to be more confident, having almost put on a show to be more confident in an area sometimes you're not, um, to get the reaction and to the, to the standard that you needed to get to. And just bounce it back to Georgie then, what challenges have you been faced with and how have you been able to overcome them? Is there one that springs to mind? Um, I mean, many challenges. Um, the big thing for me and probably everyone on the call and people that are watching um, is assumptions are obviously always made. Before you've done anything, there's the assumption there that you're either a physio, some sort of maybe an analyst, maybe, maybe spectator, who knows. Um, but I think, again, you've got to be confident with that. So there's obviously going to be assumptions, but that's fine, especially with like people thinking you're a physio. Well, majority of physios, not all, but a lot of physios are female. So we don't need to take offence by that, because if I take offence by that, then I've got no chance making it in the area I want to make it in. So I think for me, it's, yeah, just take it, laugh it off, whatever. Um, but you do, I do have realised that you do have to just get on with it. And an example that's been to mind is I was about 19 and I was going for a job interview, my first academy sort of job interview. I was about 19, I walked up to the gates and most clubs have security. So I went up to the security and I said, oh, and I said the head of coaching who I was looking for, head of the academy, sorry, who I was looking, who I was meeting. And the security guard said, oh, uh, are you his missus? And I laughed, obviously, this 19-year-old girl, like, no, laughed and said, no, I'm here for the job interview. And then he was, all right, yeah, let me in. Anyway, I went in, got the job. So for me, that's not a problem. Like, I did what I needed to do. I went in, said what I needed to say, did what I needed to do, showed the experience that I've got. Um, but it's things like that. Again, he didn't mean it in an offensive way. He wasn't trying to be rude or disrespectful. And you've got to remember that sometimes things are taken out of context. Um, but for me... You can't let uh, comments affect you because especially wanting to work in the male game, let's be honest, it'll probably get a lot worse <laughs> the higher I go, especially working in maybe if it's a championship side or League One side or a Prem side, whatever it is, I've really got to be able to continue with my journey and what I'm trying to do without letting comments from people that it doesn't it really doesn't matter what people say um but obviously that's a hard thing to develop and that's something that I've developed over many many years um and it is daunting when people are looking at looking out looking in sorry thinking I don't know if I'll be able to sort of handle those sort of comments or whatever it might be but I do get to a point where it is what it is and I'm still trying to be who I want to be and coach where I want to coach so I can't let people's comments affect my performance as a coach um, within the environments that I want to work in. You've clearly got a thick skin like Kareem has developed and clearly Hannah has with years experience. Um, so I fired the success question at Hannah followed by the challenge question to Georgie. Kareem, I'm going to give you the choice unless you want to give us a cocktail. So 
any success you feel that you've achieved specifically as a female coach in the male game or a positive experience or a challenge that stands out to you and how you overcame it? I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to do a hybrid. I like it. <laughs> so in, in terms of success, um, and I'm going to link this success bit a little bit into what Georgie was talking about earlier about you know being on site at times and being mistaken for a physio. That's happened to me a number of times. Of, uh, yeah, too many to count, maybe. And if I'm being honest, I kind of like when I've been off, oh, 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 oh. I stand by and sort of say, no, I'm, I'm here coaching. And just that in itself is so empowering to be able to say, no, I'm a coach here. Um, and for that, and then I spin it into a success for me. Um, being sort of the only and the first in that environment in RP Academy is a success and I want to open the doors for more people to have a similar success as such. Um, so that that will be one sort of yeah, big, big tick box for me um, in my opinion and the fact that I'm sort of continuing to strive in that arena. I think that the challenges um, always come and I think sometimes the challenges link to the, the opportunities and the open doors and Building, building my network, um, speaking to different people about different opportunities is really, really important in order to help gain different opportunities, different experiences to open the door. And, that, and that's, probably the, that's probably the biggest challenge around the, the boys' game is the opportunities and the open doors. And uh, But I'll, I'll keep on striving in terms of actually I'm going to obviously put forward my best self and put forward what I can do to inspire and influence and ultimately help change a culture because I think there's so, so much room there for females in the, the male game and there's so much opportunities to develop the game based on that. So I, I hopefully I can inspire a, a culture and a generation to push the, the game forward ultimately um, so that the opportunities are open for others coming behind me. Great. I mean, if I was just to summarise so far from the answers that you've all given, even when you've been faced with challenges. So you're positive, you're proactive, you're persistent, you're determined. So Hannah, to sort of bring this success challenge to, to a close, swinging more towards the challenge. So it's almost like some of the, the, the comments that might have been thrown out there, a water off a duck's back, and you've been persistent in getting to your goal and wanting to coach because it's your passion, um, it's something that you enjoy, it's something that you're very good at. But this question comes from a point of view of me as a male coach coaching the female game. I couldn't have been made to feel more welcome. So why do you think there is that for a female coach to have to deal with unfairly and inappropriately uh, in your situation? Yeah, well, when we talk about challenges, I had um, I had quite an overt sort of case um, uh, gentleman and the opposition decided to call me a barrage of names um, and he actually got a, I think it was a 10 game ban ultimately by the FA. Um, I was coaching at step four, sort of non-league, so it was national FA, I had to go to a hearing, um, it was like a court of law um, telling us, you know, I had to prove my case um, that he had been sexist in his behaviour um, and his language and he got a 10 game ban, so, you know, it's sad that those things still happen. Um, but I think the confidence, as you say, to stand up to actually um, do something about it, because it's easy to go, you know, to take it as water off the ducks, but, but it's not appropriate, it's not right, it shouldn't happen. You know, female coaches should not have to deal with that sort of stuff just because, oh, well, we're trying to do something different. We're still coaches, you know, and it shouldn't be acceptable. Um, so I suppose that was the thing that I'd point out that um, I don't think we should always just accept it. You know, again, I've all been called a physio too many times to mention. I almost wasn't let into a ground once because I thought I was a girlfriend of the player I was walking in with. I had my football boots with me. You know, I thought I was trying to get in for free um, because I was coming to watch one of the other players. Um, but if you don't, you know, face up to it and you sort of head off, I just think it, you know, it sort of goes, it becomes, it comes okay to do that. Um, but I think we should, you know, for the next generation of coaches coming through, I think we have to put our head up over the power pit and say it's not acceptable. Um, and every coach should be treated the same, regardless of gender or ethnicity or any other um, characteristic. It's football for all. That's what we want. Whilst celebrating everyone's 
differences and embracing them absolutely um, given the very small percent of females that currently do coach within the male game do you feel any extra pressure any responsibility because that's a word that's been mentioned do you feel any extra pressure when you're coaching and you're out there and that one's open I'll be open and honest. Sometimes, yes, most definitely. Because um, I'm, I'm generally, I'm different, isn't it? And, you know, my voice style is different to everyone else's. And um, I, I look different and my manner is very different. And people people notice differences. Um, and there are unconscious biases out there. Um, but with that being said, um, can't let that uncomfortable feeling hold you back. Don't get me wrong, on days it, it might make you have an off day as such but it's about i guess some step reflecting in that moment and, and reflecting afterwards so to so ultimately come stronger every day where you can um just just to you know help break down barriers and help push through glass ceilings because ultimately if if it's not started somewhere then we'll never get to a place that maybe we need to be in terms of diversity so um yeah there's definitely been uncomfortable feelings of being uncomfortable on the pitch, definitely. Can I just ask a question? Uh, Hannah, I'm going to ask this question to you because we talk about that 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 small percentage in, of, of females working specifically in the male game. Why do you think that is? Um, well, firstly, I think it's a very difficult, well, certainly professional male game, I think it's a very hard industry to get into. Um, so, you know, I would put my hands up, I think, um, you know, if you're a young male coach trying to get into the professional game, it is hard. There are a limited amount of roles. There's a lot of roles that go to ex-players. Um, so it's a, it's a tough industry to enter in the first place. Um, but I think, I think I, well, I, you know, I've been very disappointed. That's a lot of the females I know who have gone into the male professional game in an academy sense haven't had any longevity um, because the environment they've gone into has been has not been a supportive environment um, and again you could say it's not a supportive environment for males or females but it's not a positive environment to develop coaches and develop people um, and I think that we've got to look at the environments that we create um, to develop coaches uh, as well as players um, we want coaches to be able to be innovative to be creative um, but also to get support because we all need help as I say we've all needed help along the way um, it's easy to say, you know, we do X, Y, and Z. I can, you know, count all the people who've helped me on my journey, and they've been so, so key. And I think those advocates within clubs who are supporting coaches coming through the system are so, so important. I know that all three of you are keen to uh, keep growing and developing as, as coaches. Have you encountered any barriers to date which you think could be removed for others who are coming up after you? And that one I'm going to give to uh, Kareem. So, barriers to be moved, um, and I think Hannah I'm touching on it, and I sort of was alluding to it a little bit earlier in terms of sort of culture and environment of um, sort of yeah, sort of a male-dominated club uh, or male, male game, as such is that support environment and that creativity. I think sort of Hannah's spot on when she does say that. Um, if you, in general, if you allow an individual to feel empowered, you allow an individual to thrive, you allow individuals to be free, they give you their best self. When an individual feels like they're being tied up and they're being held account to every small thing and it's not a safe space, it's not an emotional safe space to maybe make mistakes or put forward ideas, then ultimately you get a different type of coach potentially someone who's not free someone who's unable to give them their best self and their best coaching so that's definitely an, a barrier i would say that can be broken down it probably needs um the club to revisit their culture and maybe there's policies within that, that that needs to be revisited to assist that maybe there's training and development within that that needs to be put in place to assist with that but ultimately if you have individuals that feel like they can bring their whole self to work, then that can only be a great environment, surely. I would concur. Georgie, are there any barriers in your way preventing you from progressing further, do you think? Um, I feel like 
there obviously are some like main ones that people be like, well, there are rad barriers, but I feel like you can create barriers by say like if I say yeah, there's those barriers, I feel like I'm just creating them and I feel I know I can get to where I want to get to. And yes, it would be difficult, but I don't think there's any barriers that I won't be able to overcome or other people following our journeys won't be able to overcome. Um yes, it's very challenging, but many things have been done that look sort of seem impossible. And I think you've got to look at it like that. I try not to look and see barriers. I try and think, well, I've got this far. I've done, I've done it for this many since I was 13. Surely I can get to this next step and this next step. So I didn't really answer the question. I do think there are certain barriers, but I think they're all things that can be broken down. And I think, like I said before, the assumptions, the stereotypes, they're quite big. They're quite big in terms of barriers, but they're definitely things that can be overcome by more people doing what we are doing. And Hannah, just to um, bring to a close this first half of questioning, what, what's been your pathway? Can you summarise that for us? And if there have been any bumps in the road along the way? <laughs> yeah, a few roundabouts and reversing down the opposite way in some directions, I think, along the way. Um, yeah, I think, um, again, I, I went into teaching. I, I've been a teacher um, at a university, um, at a college, because you had to pay the mortgage. And coaching was a hobby, a you know, something I enjoyed doing. Um, and I was really lucky, obviously, to have the opportunity to make it my profession. Um, but in terms, if we go back to the barriers question, the biggest one for me is equitable um, employment practices in terms of certainly with the professional game and certainly in terms of jobs in the game. Um, and this is for diversity as a whole. If clubs and if employers were had di sort of equitable, open, um, employment practices, I think we'd have a more diverse coaching workforce um, because there are brilliant female coaches out there and but are we actually getting opportunities, are females getting opportunities to get in front of the people to even get the jobs in the first place? Again, I'll give you loads of examples of jobs I've applied for, not even got a reply with, with an A licence, with a pro licence, you know, and I can't, having worked in the professional game and still can't get a reply for a job and you're thinking, you know, and that's just me and I'm sure there's lots of other people out there have had similar experiences but if you open your mind to who else might be out there we can have a more diverse workforce which is going to help us develop i think better well-rounded players great well thanks ever so much for your answers in the first half i did say the first half was going to go into uh, added time which it has done by a few minutes but hopefully it's been worth it to the people listening i can see that we've got uh, many a good question that have been fired in for the second half just to give uh, Georgie, Corrine and Hannah a chance to grab a, um, a drink of water, uh, we're going to invite those listening in to complete a couple of polls, just to give a little bit of context to the answers. So the first poll is up on your screen now. Please can you provide details as to your current level of coaching? And the second poll, who do you coach? And I appreciate that you might tick more than one answer, but choose the one that you coach with the most or that you have the most experience. And don't be afraid to put if you're not currently active as a coach, because that's why myself, Sarah, and our colleagues in the grassroots department exist, as well as those football development staff at County FA, because we're here to help you get into football. I know many of clubs out there who would welcome support. Great, so just looking at the polls, Sarah, if I cover the first answer, uh, if you want to pick up the second one. So just so you're aware, Georgie, Corrine, Hannah, before we dive into the, the questions that have come in from the listeners. Uh, awaiting first course, we've got 7%, so there's people out there who want to actively become coaches, and I'm sure that's down to the positive answers that we've had this evening. Uh, Playmaker, which is the new online free course, giving people an insight into what football leadership is, 4%. FA Level 1, 27%. Level 2, 24 Level 3, UEFA B, 23 uh, 12% Level 4, A licence, and then 3% representing the UEFA Pro licence. So, fair to say we've got a, a plethora there. 
Indeed, and that looks the same with around where these coaches are at. So we've got coaching girls, 22%, coaching boys, 28%, which is actually our highest. Uh, mixed, so boys and girls, is 20 Coaching men is 8%, coaching women is 11%, um, and then the other 10% are hopefully looking to step into the game. So interesting that, isn't it, Matt? Indeed. So just keep that in mind when you're answering these questions. Uh, I can see that we've got some beauties here. So the first one comes in from Melanie Kinnear. Hopefully I've pronounced your name correctly. Apologies if I haven't. How do you think we could get more girls and women involved in coaching? And I'm going to aim that one at you, Hannah, given your day job. Um, well, I think, that, again, hopefully more role models helps. Um, I, I think um, I've been really disappointed, actually, because where I'm based in Gloucestershire, we actually advertise for part-time coaches. Uh, I didn't have, we didn't have one female applicant. Um, so there's something going wrong for me in the process that, it, like, what is the, that stopping female coaches from applying from these roles? Is it because they don't feel that they're, you know, you know, they want to work in the male game? They don't feel confident working in the male game. They don't feel it's for them. There's something not right on the pathway, um, and I think we need to be encouraging more females to, you know, come and coach because you know they're paid roles, they're jobs, um, you know. So there's, there are opportunities out there, um, and there are clubs that have you know, equitable um, employment practices and who are open and do, do create positive environments and to do support their staff. Um, and I just hope we can inspire more um, girls into coaching um, through the pathway and into both the women's and men's game. Thanks, Hannah. Um, I've got a question here from Joanne Sheeran. Uh, how did you get your break into the academy slash bigger club that you are involved with now? Um, I'm going to direct that one to Corinne. So, you know, with your opportunity, perhaps at Arsenal. Yeah. So there was a program called ECAS, uh, Elite Coaches Apprenticeship Scheme. This was probably about four or five years ago now, when um, I basically interviewed for that particular program. And the, the idea of the program is it's a Premier League program. It's a one for two, no, four years even. Um, so two of them years you. You're, you're part of a course, a really intense course, like a leadership course, but then also you're placed with an academy full time as well. So I went for the interview for that, and I was successful in the interview with that. But I was soon realizing that because the program was fairly new, and when I say new, it was sort of its second year of, um, of many years, it, it, I found that actually the processes to place me with a club uh, were not yet had not yet had their foundations. So in actual fact, placing in the club in, in a full-time role never quite transpired. And as soon as I realized that that was the direction it was going in, I spoke to my Premier League representative and I asked if he can maybe speak to a couple of London-based clubs about me maybe volunteering or shadowing. Um, and it so happens that he, he spoke to Arsenal Academy, he spoke to West Ham as well, and also some other conversation with West Ham, but he also spoke to Arsenal Academy. And I, yeah, randomly, I wasn't expecting it, got a call from the Academy manager at that point in time. So that was, sort of, yeah, like I mentioned, about four and a half seasons ago. Um, and he sort of, yeah, said, come down, just have a conversation. And he was, he was really supportive. Um, he I was going for my A license at that point in time. And based on that, he was like, okay, then let's get you into under 14, let's get you into the system with the under 14, so that can really help you with your A license development. Uh, and from there, whilst initially I was um, doing a bit of shadowing, it, it very quickly turned into a, a paid role for me. Um, so I wasn't shadowing for very long. And, and that's very much about trying to go in there, being confident, and trying to take the opportunity where you can, um, because these doors don't always open. So when they do open, like grab it with both hands and, and be confident. But with that confidence, also be brave enough to ask questions if you are unsure about something because we don't have all the answers. And ultimately, I was there to learn. So I was confident enough in myself to not know things as well and then ask the questions so I can be a better version of myself and also, you know, a developing coach as well. So maybe a bit of advice is to keep knocking on those doors then. One, 100%. One closes, go and find another one and, and knock on it. One of them will open. Love that. 
Thanks, Corinne. Uh, Georgie, I mentioned at the start in your introduction that you came out of the FA Club Placement Programme. So maybe consider that when um, answering this question. But Curtis Child asks, do you think that sometimes it's more difficult for female coaches to get mentors in a male setting? Because I'm guessing that you had some sort of mentorship as part of the FA Club Placement Programme. Yeah, I feel, I mean, it could be more difficult, but I feel you can, having like people to look up to or to help you, for me, it doesn't have to be another woman. It could be, but anyone can be a mentor. Anyone can help you through this journey. And for me, the support that I got at Birmingham from all the staff, regardless of what department they're in, was something that I haven't experienced before. So that really opened my, opened my eyes and I realised, oh, there the are very decent people in football, especially at Birmingham City. And the group there, the support has been ongoing. Even tonight doing this webinar, it's when they all found out, they're like, yeah, I'm going to watch it, extra pressure, going to watch it, going to make sure I see you on there. So little things like that help a lot because they show their interest and they show that they're going to support me during this journey, regardless of who I am and what I'm doing in the club but the placement definitely opened my eyes to the different avenues you can go into within an academy and the people that are there to help you and support you um so that's been really good to see um throughout my placement and now my my actual job at the club well I'm sure Stuart English and co are watching this beaming with pride your contribution this evening <laughs> Uh, we've got another question in so from Jody Williams. Hi, Jody. So her question is around, are there any experiences that have enhanced your coaching that you might not have got in the female game? So anything that you've got from the male game that maybe you wouldn't have got from the female game? And conversely, if you've then coached in uh, the women and girls game, is there anything in there that you've got that maybe you don't get in the male game? So big question. Uh, interesting question, I think. Uh, Hannah, what would your thoughts be be around this? I give you that big one. That's a hard question. Um, I think when I first started, I know the reason I wanted to do my, um, I suppose, my apprenticeship, almost my learning within the male game, was the game is quicker. And when I was going through again the pathway of the ed coach education pathway, and there was no choice. You coach, you know, you co had to coach men on your assessment. It's not like now where it's in situ and it's your players. Back then it was you had the players who were on your course who, you know, were nine times out of ten male. So for me it was trying to the speed of the game and therefore the speed of the sort of the sort of the coaching that you had to do um live within sort of an A license or a B license assessment session. Um I think that helped me through that coach education pathway how it was at the time. Um I think the changes help that massively now the fact that you can do assessments in situ with your players um, is a lot more specific to the individual but back in the day you sort of needed that to get through the you know as i say i think somebody asked what was the right what i said was the right way of coaching i think it was more about hitting the standards to pass your a license or to pass your b license and um, so you had to show certain levels of knowledge it was very much a stop stand still show your knowledge um, when you stopped it and to do that you had to be quite confident to be able to stop that group at the right time to recreate the scenario to be able to get your point across um, so you needed to do that um, but I would say as a female working the male game I think I bring loads to the table that is different to my male counterparts I actually find myself having to stop myself sometimes because I always say I'm the soft one but I don't think I'm the soft one I'm just the one with a little bit of empathy or a little bit of emotional intelligence um, to think about how the other person might feel um, and I think that is something that's massively missing within the male professional game is that just a little bit of empathy of thinking about well if we keep kicking him when he's down he's going to keep going you know backwards not do so well if we give him a bit of confidence a little bit of love a little bit of a you know support you might help somebody so I think um, again it goes back to having different people around the table having these conversations about players if we're all from the same background, if we all have the same um, experiences, we're all going to come up with the same answer. By having people with different experiences and different backgrounds, we'll hopefully find some different solutions which might help a player get across the line to get a professional contract or get onto the next age group or whatever their next challenge might be. So demonstrating, acknowledging and understanding empathy, some would say is a strength, a great strength, not a weakness. 
and those out there that believe that coaching is about relationships that's that's a good answer to underpin that um this next one i'm going to uh fire at yourself kareen and i'm going to steal your line from earlier it's going to be a hybrid because i've seen three or four questions under the same heading so i'm going to try and merge them together and and frame it um along the lines of what would you having coached in both the male and the female game in some cases simultaneously did you ever consider moving across purely to focus on the female game at any point so I, I started in the female game, so I started, so in terms of elite, elite football, I started um, with the girls' academy before I coached with the boys' academy. Um, there was a point in time somewhere in the middle where I was coaching across both the, the boys' academy and the girls' academy. Um, with that being said, obviously now I'm solely within the boys' academy, and would I sort of stop in the boys' academy to focus on females? If I'm being honest, I don't think I have to. Um, I think me being currently in the boys' game is, is empowering so many, not only those who are inspiring to be coaches in the boys' game, but then also I give something different to the players in the boys' game as well. And I think that's so important. Um, with, with that being said, I hope that I am able to inspire those in the girls' game as well by just being in the position I am in. Um, so yeah, there's there's no sort of black and white answer in terms of yeah, I'm just going to stop the boys' game and I'm going to jump to the, the females' game. But wherever I am, I just want to be able to make an impact and impact and help influence things for the better. Ultimately. A very hybrid, adapted answer as well. Nice. <laughs> uh, Georgie, I've got a question for you from uh, Estelle Handy. So she has, she's asked, uh, what advice would you give to a young female coach who's looking to eventually transition from grassroots into uh, the professional or uh, elite game? Confidence. That's, that's the word you've got to focus on. And I think, like I said before, you're not always feeling 100%, but you've got to show that. And like what Hannah said before about putting on a performance it is sometimes like, like you do have to perform to put on the right session to get the right things the right object, ob objectives out or help your players in individual players in certain areas so confidence is the biggest thing for me and take every opportunity when it when it shows up and just take it and try it might not work then you can try something else the amount of times that I've been in different environments and I've had good bad experiences but I think that's building that builds you as a person especially working in this in these environments so for me confidence and like i said before any opportunity to go and coach go and do it um that's like vital for that transition from grassroots into elite environments um because then you'll know your stuff and you've got to show that you know your stuff but also show that you want to learn more and you want to progress um is a big thing i think just the ongoing learning is so big and it never stops. Whether you're coaching at the level I'm at or the level that Kareem's at or that Hannah's at, like it's continuous and you've got to just take it in your stride and just it doesn't matter if things go wrong, you've just got to keep going. So confidence is the biggest one for me. You've always got to go in with confidence to show them that you've got what it takes to do the job that is in front of you. So almost to link back to the message before is to keep knocking on them doors, a bit of self-belief and uh, yeah. never stop learning. This next question sort of follows on, so I'm looking at you for this one, yeah, Corrine. Um, this, comes from, this comes from Danielle Evans. I remember Marianne Spacey saying once that she had to control the football from so many feet high to gain respect slash attention from male players. Have you ever had to show male players that you know what you are talking about when actually coaching? Yeah, they're, they're definitely, in my early days, felt like that additional pressure. Um, but sometimes I reflect on it and I wonder if that was in my head because I think ultimately, once you're on the grass and you coach with confidence um, and you engage with confidence, then that young person ultimately just is looking at another human being and in actual fact, whilst you know young people are influenced by many things around them their biases are not quite the same as adults because they haven't been influenced as much as adults so in actual fact for the most part um young male players ultimately in my experience um will go with 
what you give them. And if th there's days that I'm not giving them enough, then you know they'll probably call me out on it. But if there's days where I'm giving them more than enough, then again, that, that respect is shown. So I think with that being said, there's always going to be that element of feeling that, oh, in actual fact, I'm maybe having to go above and beyond because of me being a female in a male's game. But then sometimes I question myself and say, well, Karina, is, actually, is it that in your head and is that holding you back? In actual fact, if you bring your best self, evidence has shown that actually these players are going to engage and respect you nonetheless. And another example of relationships, interpersonal skills, trusting the knowledge that you do have rather than worrying about the little bit that you might not have at the right time. Yes, exactly just, that. If I just to bounce that one back to you, Georgie, so the same question, do you feel like you've ever had to show your, your worth, so to speak? And maybe go into when you've been working with the university men's team at Demonford University. Um, they definitely have tested me in the past in various areas. Um, and they would admit that and they'd know and they would continue to do it even after me saying this now, uh, which I think is a good thing. So I think you do as a coach, regardless of where you are, I think you should be tested. And I always get my players to challenge me. So if they're not getting minutes or they're unhappy, I say, come and tell me. And then after training, they're like, can I ask why I didn't get minutes? And I'll go, yeah, absolutely. This, this and this. So I think you've got to have that. But I do try and push for that because I think it makes me better as a coach and individual if I say test me. But that, yeah, there have been times, even with younger players, where you do get tested on your knowledge to see what you know. But I mean, my, my last name helps me a lot. I go in and I already know a lot anyway, regardless. So I think definitely university level, that's definitely challenged me in a different and new way, which has been great for my development. Um, but I think the lads actually enjoy testing me and seeing how far they can sort of take it, um, which again is, I think, developing me and pushing me and challenging me for when I get to that next level of my career. And you're right, that surname's a great point of connection. <laughs> and I don't mind admitting my vulnerability, I actually spelled it incorrectly, didn't I? On something. It's all right, you're forgiven. It's all right. I got a capital letter wrong. Or, or did yeah, it's a it small right? V, it's a small V. Small V, that's yeah, so I've learned that. <laughs> Sarah, I think we've probably got time for maybe two more. Uh, okay, then. So um, we've got a question from Leah Wise, and she has asked, how do you deal with low-key discrimination from parents and peers? If, of course, this, this has happened. So, uh, Hannah, any any of that experience from you? Um, I suppose, I don't know how low-key it is. My, some of my biggest frustrations throughout my career were... Um, there is a, there's a generalization that female coaches should be with the younger age groups, usually foundation phase. Um, I had an A license working in an academy. Where I was the only part-time coach with an A license. I worked with the under nines. And I helped the under 18s coach get through his A license because I passed it and he hadn't. And I suppose, again, it wasn't, I'm, I think I'm quite lucky. I think I've, within the context I've worked, I've always had the support because I think the culture has been right. And I've been really lucky in that instance that the culture around the organizations that I've worked with, I've always been very supportive. Um, so I don't feel between my peers, I've had much um, low level um, or, or, or even the parents. Um, I think the parents actually really appreciate somebody a little bit different. I think you didn't know that Sarah, I haven't you know, worked in it yourself. I think actually the parents appreciate the care you give their children because I think they see that, and, and especially, again, within teaching, um, they're used to having females um, teach their children. So I, I don't didn't find too much of that. Um, I think the biggest sort of discrimination you tend to find is other people outside your organisation. So the physio, um, quick, that you get too often. Um, speaking to your male colleague, you know, so I run the academy, I'm in charge of the academy, and I will stand there with a male colleague, and they'll speak to my male colleague, and won't speak to me. Um, and I quite often have to sort of tell them that as well. <laughs> um, so I suppose it's those things. It's people outside of your organisation who don't get it, I suppose. because people within it get it because they see you, the respect that you, you work with them every day and you, you have that. People externally, a bit like... So um, Karine mentioned ECAS. Um, so I was a, um, a mentor on ECAS. So 
example, I had a male coach who I mentored on ECAS. And his um, peers would say to him, so, so what's it like then having, 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 a, having a woman, you know, as your mentor, having a woman help you? Because that can't be right, right? A woman telling a man how to coach? Could that be right? You know, and the, the coaching question was very supportive and very helpful. But, um, you know, he had my back and he respects everything that I do. Um, but again, I think it's those people who aren't in your environment are the ones that tend to not I suppose, show you the level of respect that you'd like to think that they would. Definitely around that cultural piece and more uh, seeing to normalise it as well, Hannah. Mm. And again, that's a nice little segue into this, into this final question, although I know Sarah's got a, um, a, a full stop killer question to, <laughs> to finish the webinar. So that's one from our listeners tuning in. Peter and Justine asks, Along those lines, do you think there should be a root and branch reform of how the culture looks in the male game? And that's open to any one of you or all of you if you want to give a quick answer on that one. Um, I mean, I'd say perhaps, but also there's a lot of good within the male game, a lot of good. But like Hannah was just saying, a lot of a lot of it comes from outside, it comes from external people looking in, and that's normally where a lot of the challenges come from, from maybe supporters or other coaches that aren't in your organisation. Um, I think it's something maybe to look at, but I think the culture is such a big thing. Personally, I wouldn't want too much of it to change. Obviously, it needs to be equal for everyone, but I think changing it too much could change the game too much without a positive effect um but i think like i just said what hannah said about external people that's for me is one of the biggest things um is how you're viewed from these people that really don't matter the amount of people that when they find out what i do and these are just like random people and i say oh yeah coach coach football and they say oh in the female game i go no in the male game i coach men and they go oh do they listen to you Every time in my head, I'm thinking, what are you on about? Of course, they listen to me, like, I'm their coach, I'm their gaffer. But, and like, that's normally how I respond. I normally laugh and go, yeah, of course they do. And I think that is, it's like, a, more, it's bigger than football. It's a society thing as well. So I think football's like the smaller picture almost. It's, yes, it could, the culture maybe need to, does need to shift slightly. But there is a lot of good in there, which is clear because we are where we are um, and we've got to where we've got to yes with a lot of hard work and with some discrimination but i think there is a lot of good within the game which hopefully other people can see it is just it is a very challenging environment whoever you are um but that's sort of my take on that kareem the culture of the male game does it need to change if it does what needs to change or is it a case of working with it yeah so I, I probably won't use the word change. I, I, I'm going to use the word there's room for development. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I use that from a point of view is similar to what Jordi's saying. There are a lot of good things, a lot of good people within the infrastructure of football clubs who want to practice diversity. I think with that then being said, there has to be stuff underpinning some of that thought. There have to be processes and systems that underpin some of that thought around one diversity. Now, I know the Premier League have, you know, began to have conversations, want to put things in place, so it might be high-right uh, organisations and institutes like that that might have to support clubs to help implement change, as well as the DFL, as an example. But then also, the clubs and their executives and their senior leaders have a responsibility to put in place systems and processes to allow for, as an example, um, more diverse advertising. So where are we putting adverts or more diverse placements? Um, and who are we giving up these opportunities to? Or more diverse panels, for example, so that the panels are, are representing people that they want to attract to the organization. But part of it has to come from the top, but then also there's an impact on the bottom up, bottom up as well. And I guess I can take part in that. Um, so development is a great opportunity to develop. Uh, because there's loads of great things happening, but there's more things that can be done. Top down, bottom up approach has to work. We have to collaborate and communicate. 
across yeah. the board it helps sarah did you want to um come in with your final thought question it's a question that I'd, you know i'm keen to explore myself and i hope that i do see it but the uh, million dollar question is so for, for you guys on the call when will we see a woman leading a men's professional team as a manager in those top levels of the game or will we that's open to anyone i'll go if you want um yes you will and i believe it will be one of us three on this call right now okay. i'm aiming for it to be me but you know it's we're all on the same journey we're all trying to get there so there's no competition i'll be happy for any of us but yeah i think it is going i do think it's going to happen um like i said before and i think hannah and kareem will agree with me it's it's not necessarily being about about being the first you want to try and be the best you can possibly be within that environment that's how i look at it so when i was younger i'd be like yeah i want to be the first female coach in a male team but now it's like no i want to be the best coach possible at that level whoever i'm up against whatever whatever manager i'm up against and i do have a lot of role models to look up to but i do think it is going to happen um i wouldn't say soon but i'd say soon within reason um but i do have confidence in myself and other people other women working in the game that it's definitely going to happen yes with many challenges and many tweets about it but you know it's it's definitely going to happen and i can't wait yeah there's been a small example of that with shelly Kerr. um she was managing a men's team at one point so, yeah i definitely think it's possible um but i'll be honest i'll be real honest, in my lifetime um because as the game currently looks um you know it doesn't look like it's happening tomorrow as an example as an extreme example but i definitely think that a good example to suggest that yes the game can definitely head in that direction but then with representation like this that we've got on this webinar today and also the right powers that be trying to develop their culture but then also the right systems and processes in place it, it makes that journey a lot easier hannah is that the ultimate aim for yourself um i think the important thing for me is and, and i'm sure everybody feels the same is there's an element you don't want to be the token if i was ever to get a role in the game i want it because i'm good enough and because i'm qualified and because i'm experienced and i bring quality to the role um so i feel that sometimes there's a bit, lot of fuss around it to be the first to get a um a reaction i suppose um and i think the part of me is about being genuine and being um respected and having that journey and doing that journey and getting the roles and the opportunities that i deserve because i've worked hard and i've gained the knowledge and i've gained the experience to deserve those opportunities and if that comes along the way fantastic um but if not and you keep working hard and keep trying to do best you can and I think one of the things to come out tonight, amongst many things, is that um, work ethic is needed across the board, whether you're uh, a female coach in the male game or vice versa. And persistence is key. The doors that you keep knocking on, how you knock, the timing of your knock, also accepting a bit of a lift from time to time, looking around you for support, guidance, but also standing on your own two feet and believing what you can offer and playing to your strengths. These are key things that have come out for me as I've been listening tonight. For you, Sarah? Just the bravery and the determination of all you guys on the call tonight. Um, it's inspiring. And I hope that people listening and watching uh, feel the same and show that you can do it if, if it's something that you, you want to pursue. So thank you so much for giving up your time this evening. It's been great to have you. Yeah, on behalf of Sarah and also the people listening in, thank you for giving up yet another evening. I know there's three active coaches evenings are very precious so uh, i've certainly enjoyed your insights as has sarah and looking at the questions which we haven't got through apologies to those and um, clearly people are keen for a part two or part three so uh, in terms of what next there might be future webinars uh, if i just direct you to the, the closing slide
for those out there wanting more, if you are on Zoom social media, the hashtag female coach male game. If you have any feedback for us, any questions, um, any comments that you want to share, we're all, all ears. Uh, and I'll certainly be active on Twitter over the next few days. Uh, the FA Boot Room and Coaching Community, which is replaced Hive. If uh, Hive was something that you used on a regular basis, the Coaching Community has replaced that link to the FA Boot Room. And then the other thing, as a follow-up, uh, it's going to be an expression of interest email that will come out in the next few days or weeks in the, in the build-up to Christmas, just letting you know that the FA grassroots team is in existence and we have uh, different teams within the department to be able to support you. So if you'd like an arm of support, please complete that expression of interest. All that's left to say is, is a final thanks to Georgie, Corrine and Hannah. It's been really, really um, insightful and we wish you well on your coaching journeys until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.